What was that? <laughs> so today we're going to learn all about heat movement. Hooray! There are three ways that heat can transfer from one object to another object. The first is called conduction. Conduction works best in solids and especially in metallic solids. And in conduction, heat moves molecule by molecule because they're in contact with each other. So if we got a bunch of molecules that are all hooked up next to each other, if I start shaking one, increasing its molecular kinetic energy, since it's stuck to the next guy, he gets shaken, and it works kind of like that. And so it gets shaken on down the line, and so the energy spreads. But the energy does not spread equally in all substances. Some solids cannot heat very efficiently, we call them conductors, and some do not move heat efficiently, we call those insulators. And it turns out that conductors are made out of metals and insulators are made out of non-metals. Now, <clears throat> the reason why a conductor conducts so well and an insulator does not is because of the arrangement of molecules. In a metal, the molecules line up in very nice, tight little rows. And so it's kind of like if I would take you guys, and you guys are all molecules, and I would line you up in one nice, tight row, and everybody hugs the person in front of them. So you're all in one nice tight row, and I come on to the first person, and I smash him in the face. <laughs> What's going to happen? Everyone's going to get a bloody nose, right? <laughs> the heads are just going to go all the way down the line, and the energy would transfer very efficiently. Now, if we are an insulator, if we're a non-metal, we typically do not line up in those really tight rows. That would be like if I took all you guys and randomly shoved you into the corner. If I randomly shoved you into the corner and then smashed somebody, who would it affect? Just the people that are right away next to them, but the people that are farther off, it wouldn't affect nearly as much. And that's kind of the way it works with the non-metals. So the non-metals, it does not move so efficiently through. The energy kind of stays in one spot and doesn't go too far. In the metals, it goes really, really far. If you've ever been to SAS on a nice cold night, you get to sit down on cold bleachers. metal bleachers. Cold metal bleachers. And these are nice metal bleachers. And you sit down on this metal bleacher and 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 two hours later your butt is still cold because the heat is going into the metal and it's being conducted outward and you're trying to come in equilibrium with the whole bleacher and that doesn't work very well. Now if you're intelligent on a cold day, what you do is you bring along some newspaper. So if you bring along a little section of newspaper and set it down, you sit on that cold newspaper, and heat from your butt comes out and gets into the newspaper and stops. It doesn't go into the metal. It doesn't get transferred out. So it stays in one nice spot. And so that newspaper is really great. Newspapers make really good insulators. If you've ever seen pictures of homeless people up north, what do they like to sit on the park bench covered in? Blankets. Newspapers. So let's make jackets out of newspapers and stay really warm. Uh, our, our jackets work better, but I'm saying if you're, if you're looking for a cheap insulator, newspapers are good because people read them and then they toss them away and almost people are smart and say, hey, I'm grabbing this out of the trash and this is my blanket. And, and it does work quite well. So, anyway, we make insulation to prevent heat movement, and so, of course, we're going to make insulation out of insulators. It doesn't make sense to make insulation out of a metal. That's not going to work very well. I once lived in a house. I know, shocking to hear, right? No. I once lived in a little house that was up north, and it didn't have central air conditioning. It just had air conditioning in one room of the house. And it was one of those big air conditioners that was like half inside the house and half outside the house. And that wasn't a problem during the summer or during the spring or during the fall. But in the winter, it got very, very, very cold up there. And it got really cold and you had this big metal box that was half in your house and half out of your house. So if it was 25 degrees outside, then that metal box was 25 degrees inside. This is not a good thing to have sitting in your living room. So we developed a little thing where we would wrap it up in blankets and put a thing over it and, and cover it with lots of insulation because I wanted to keep that away from the rest of my room. We do it together.
got to do. Our second method of heat movement is called convection. And in convection, whole groups of molecules move in a circular motion. Because it has to be free to move, it can only work with a liquid or a gas, a fluid. So fluids are able to convect, but solids are not. If I heat up one corner of the desk really hot, this corner of the hot desk can't move over to another corner. It's stuck right there. So the only way this solid desktop can move is by conduction. So if I heat up this part, it wiggles and wiggles and wiggles and wiggles and slowly works its way down, but the desk itself doesn't move. Oh, has anybody ever been to a campfire before? And, and you want to roast marshmallows, and the only thing you have is a hanger, a wire hanger, and you undo it, and you stick the hanger in one end, and you're holding on the other end, and what happens? You have to drop the hanger pretty quick, because one end, it, it conducts that heat really well. But if you do that with a stick, does that work? Yes. No. Oh, wait, that doesn't Yeah, it doesn't heat me up. So yeah, it doesn't, the heat doesn't move up the stick. So you can hold it just fine on one end and the other end can be on fire and your end is nice and cool. <laughs> that works quite nicely. So anyway, convection, what happens is we get groups of molecules that move in a circular motion. And this gets kind of interesting. Um, let's pretend this is Laredo on a typical summer day. So outside your house, it is hot. Hi. And inside you want it to be relatively speaking cold right but in between the hot outside and the cold inside you have a wall now what happens is you have like say you have some bricks out here well as the sun is beating on these bricks these bricks are getting hotter and so the air that's inside touches these bricks and by conduction they get hotter but what happens is these molecules start wiggling faster and faster and faster and as they wiggle faster the air space in between them gets bigger and so they become less dense well, less dense air is going to go upward, and so these start to float upward. Well, the opposite problem is happening on the other side of the room. What happens is the air in the house, in, in the wall here, is hotter than the air in the house, and so heat is being lost into your house. And so this is losing energy. As it loses energy, it becomes more dense, and it starts to drift down. So if this is going down and this is going up, then they end up shoving each other over on the sides. And basically the air is moving. It's not going like turbo, but it's going nice and slowly and it's slowly moving this hotter air, which is depositing heat inside your house and then it's coming back over here and getting recharged. So this is happening. This is called convection. So what we want to do to stop this convection is we like to trap the air into very, very small little pockets. So instead of having one big bubble that is free to move inside the wall, we have lots and lots of little bubbles. So we fill this up with lots of random glass fibers. And the glass fibers don't actually stop the heat movement. What they do is they just trap the air, which is very good at not conducting and they trap it into small little pockets so that it has to convect like 14 times before it gets over to the other side of the wall. So that's good. It makes it harder for them to move around. If you've ever been cooking on a stove, if you have a gas stove, which I do, which is kind of nice, I like the gas stove. When you have a gas stove underneath it, you have this little ring of fire. And so the fire heats the edges of the pot, but the inside of the pot relatively speaking, is cool. So what happens is <coughs> the water starts moving up on the edges and it starts moving down in the middle and it ends up cooking like this where it's going. And it has what we call a rolling boil. And it almost looks like a donut. And so it's coming up on the outside and down in the middle and you can put your macaroni in there and it stirs itself because it's moving in a big circle. That circle that it's moving in is a big convection cell. Now what's even cooler about convection cells is, 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 ignore what it says here, we're going to just continue to draw. Here we have the earth. The earth is covered with an atmosphere. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> covered, surrounded, whatever you want. Now, the atmosphere in reality is about as thick as that line is, but we're going to pretend that it's 
Much bigger. Big so it's easier to draw. Now, does the Earth get equally heated everywhere? Nope. It does not. If the sun is way over here, then the sun is closer to this part than it is to the pole. And so what happens is this gets heated more than the poles do. And so what people thought when they were first starting to study atmospheric science is they thought, well, okay, it's going to get hotter here, and so air should rise. And rising air we tend to associate with, it's different what pressure is on the top versus on the bottom, but we associate this with clouds. And then at the poles, this would be where it starts to sink, and the sinking air we get the... the sunny stuff. And so they thought, well, what's going to happen is the atmosphere is going to turn into one huge puppy of a uh, convection cell. And so it should just go up from the equator and down at the pole, and we'd have this huge convection cell. Well, it almost works that way. But it didn't quite work that way. What they didn't figure is that, you know, realistically, since the atmosphere is so much thinner, that's really hard to crank that much air into one big convection cell. And so it breaks into three. And so what we find is that it's going up here, but then it comes down here. And then it goes up here. And then it comes down here. So we end up with one, the polar air mass is going this way, and the mid-latitude air mass is going this way, and the tropical air mass is going that way. So we end up with three different air masses on the northern hemisphere. This is all like one big tube. Um, and then down in the southern hemisphere, we get it again, we get the same type of thing happening. So what happens is, of course, if this would be on the equator, and this would be the pole, and you say, hey, that's a 90 degree angle. So if we chop this into three pieces, then this would be right at 30. 30 degrees latitude, and this one would be right at 60. 60 degrees latitude. And like we said, it would tend to be cloudy on the equator, but it should also be cloudy at 60 degrees. And it's going to be sunny at the pole, and it's also going to be sunny at... 30 degrees. Now, that's not to say that 30 degrees never has clouds and that the poles or the, the equator never has sunny sky. It does happen, but what happens is this is the general trend is that we have that <coughs> sinking air happening at 30 degrees and the rising air happening at here and here. And so we break it into different convection cells here. So that, what happens is basically we get this tropic air mass, and the tropical air mass tends to be fairly isolated. It doesn't mix as much with the other one. And then this is called the mid-latitude one. And then we have the polar one on top. So the polar mass is going to be there on top. Now, what happens is the polar mass, of course, it gets cold, but then we get some mixing. Now, the reason we get mixing to a large extent is because as the Earth is moving around the sun, we're tilted. And so sometimes we're closer to the sun, sometimes we're farther away from the sun, depending on you know, if we stay tilted. And while we're on this side, we're farther away, and on this side, we're closer. So as we're tilted along like that, it starts messing with these. And so it doesn't stay perfectly like this. And they start intermixing. And we get these little waves. And so I don't know if you guys have ever watched the, the, the Weather Channel, but they'll have like these jet streams that are going through here, and it's the one that's up on top that's more important. And it'll start getting these waves that go in, that they call Rossby wave. And sometimes they start getting bigger and bigger, and so you'll end up with the polar air mass will come out here, and the mid-latitude air mass is going up there. And so you'll get sometimes, some people will have warmer weather too high, and other people have cold weather too low. And it's when those waves are coming down that start messing with our weather. But if you've ever watched the weather, you notice that these fronts come in, and they keep pushing down, but they only push down until they hit at 30 degrees here. What happens is we have this sunny. We have basically a permanent high pressure system that's built in 
at 30 degrees. And so if the storm is strong enough, it can push through there, but most of the time what happens is you have this 30 degree line and you have this nice cold front coming down and you say, hey, the cold front is gonna come down. We're finally gonna get some relief from our heat in the summer. And it comes down and it hits 30 degrees and says, nah, I'm just gonna go that way. Has anybody ever noticed that the storms like to come in and they hit San Antonio and they come toward us and they hit about Catula and then they just, yeah. <laughs> over and over and over? Yeah, we're sitting at about 28 degrees latitude. So 30 degrees is just a little north of us, and all the time it comes down toward us and uh, pushes over to the side. So we're like, oh, we were so close. We almost got rain. <laughs> and it never quite happens, man. Yeah. Except when you don't want it to. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, we get these big convection cells, and these big convection cells, of course, affect our weather. And so it, it's kind of interesting to know about that. Our third method of heat movement is called radiation. And most people, when they hear radiation, they get really scared because they think of nuclear radiation and we're all going to die and grow a third head and all these weird things like that. But yeah, the same thing that your grandmother gets afraid because your microwave says it emits radiation and she's like, don't look into it, your eyes will melt. Yeah. Right? So they're afraid of nuclear radiation. That's not what we're talking about here. Radiation is heat that's traveling in infrared waves. And infrared is very, very similar to visible light. And so like visible light, we can reflect it, we can absorb it, we can emit it. That means to give up. So the color that absorbs infrared waves best, you guys should all know. Let's pretend it's fifth block on, in August and they're calling a fire drill. What color do you not want to be wearing? Black. Exactly. The color that absorbs infrared waves best is black. You've worn black in the sunshine before and you said, ouch. <laughs> this really absorbs the heat and just turns it straight into heat. The poor emo kids are always out there melting. We're going turbo on anything here, I guess. The color that reflects infrared waves would rate infrared. I can't talk infrared. Infrared. infrared waves the best is going to be what? White. Yeah, if I'm going to be outside working in the summer, I'm always wearing a white t-shirt because white reflects that much, much nicer. It's going to be a whole lot better. Um, you want what would be even better is to wear a little mirror suit, but those are not very practical. I have a whole bunch of coolers at home. I have different ice chests, and some of them are different colors. I have green ones, and I have red ones, and I have orange ones, but every single one on the inside is colored white. White. Every cooler I've ever seen is colored white inside. It's there for a reason, because that reflects this infrared waves better. Now, the color that gives off heat the best, the color that emits heat, what color cools down faster? So what we're saying is, we've been outside, we're all hot, when we come inside and let it cool down, what color cools down the fastest? And that turns out to be black also. Black heats up the best, black also cools down the best. So we take Bob outside, he's going to be really, really toasty very quickly, but we bring him inside, he's going to cool down faster than a ball that would be similarly sized but different color. So, yeah. So interesting. So that is radiation. Now, if you've ever been to a campfire, like we were talking about before, if we have a campfire that's going, and you are out here standing next to the campfire, what gets warm and what does not get warm? Your face. Your face gets warm. Has anybody ever been near a campfire on a cold day? Okay, that's that's the hard part. We go out and we make a campfire and you stay far away because it's already hot outside. But twice a year, it gets cold enough that you could go outside and make it cold <laughs> and have a campfire. And if you've ever been out on one of those days, you will find that whatever is facing the fire is nice and toasty. But the side of you that's not facing the fire is still frozen in. And the reason for this is, again, there's three methods that we could get heat from the fire. One is, the first one is conduction, but in between you and the fire, there's dirt. 
dirt is not a good conductor. So you're standing a certain distance away and the, and the ground isn't getting super hot because you're standing there because we don't make the dirt out of metal. So, you know, that's, yeah, for sure. It would be way better, man. No, it would not. So my feet are not going to get hot from conduction happening between the fire and there. So the other method is convection. Well, convection is trying to make it move in big circles, and it does move in big circles, but the only way you're going to feel it is if somebody is trying to roast you over the fire. <laughs> so if you're up here, you're having a very bad day because that would be where you would feel it. So the convection is happening upwards, and it, it's trying to do this, but there's not much on the top to slow it down. So it pretty much just goes up and stuff gets pulled in from the side, and that actually makes it worse for you. So you don't like that part. So unless you're roasting over the top of it, you're not going to feel the convection. Um, the radiation, on the other hand, what happens is the infrared waves do bounce off of you. And as they hit your body, your body absorbs them and it turns into heat. So whatever's in a direct line, that you're going to feel. But you're not going to feel it the other way. Now, how would you feel it on the back of you? At, at a campfire, you don't want to spend all your time turning around like a hot dog on the thing. At, at, okay. Anyway, so you don't want to do that. So if we've got our fire, this time we're looking down from the top. And so this is this is your head, and this is your friend's head, and this is your other friend's head. I don't have that many friends, but if I did, that would be... Okay, so we have four of us standing around the campfire. And we're all facing the fire, so our front sides are all cooking and our back sides are all frozen. How do we keep our back sides warm? Build another fire back with everyone in the We could build lots of little campfires, or we could bring mirrors. What if my friends didn't bring a mirror, but I'm all cool like that, and I brought two mirrors and I stuck them right here? What would happen is the infrared waves, they would come and they would be cooking the front of my body, but some of them would come here and bounce off, and the ones that hit here and bounce off would cook the back side of my body. So if I brought these mirrors along, I could stay warm all the way around. They said, hey, this is great, and it would actually be nice, but nobody ever does that. If you go to Academy, they actually sell this thing called an emergency blanket. And an emergency blanket, it's a, so thin that you can stick it in your back pocket. You can keep it in your glove compartment of your car. And you say, in an emergency, I'll have this blanket. It'll be great. And you take it apart, and all it is is a thin piece of foil. <laughs> and you're like, this is a total ripoff. If I want a blanket to keep me warm, it's got to be something big and thick and heavy, right? That's what you feel like, because those are the blankets that do feel nice and warm. So the ones that weigh 40 pounds and you down to your bed and you're like, oh, I feel toasty. <laughs> but in reality, this little piece of foil keeps you quite warm because your body is constantly radiating heat. And so if you wrap yourself in foil, the heat that you are radiating out hits that foil and Bounces. radiates back in. And you say, there's no way that could work. Try it. Go home, especially if your dad's too cheap to turn on the heat at home and it's cold in your house. Go home and make yourself a little foil helmet. <laughs> and I guarantee you, you'll be like, wow, this is really warm. And you take it off and it's like, oh, it's cold. And you think, oh, my God, oh, this is great. And it, it really does make a difference. So this little foil helmet works great at, at reflecting that heat. Isn't that a little how a isn't that a little how atomic bombs work? Except, you know, without the core thing. When you put you know, when the well, when the both halves of the core are close together, the rate, you know, the thing inside, you know, all the radiation gets trapped and eventually gets too much. Well, that one happens more because of a chain reaction that happens. Every time one neutron hits an atom, it splits off and gives off three neutrons. So that hits nine neutrons, that hits, and it keeps all ex exponentially going up. And, and yeah, it starts pushing pretty good. So that's radiation. Now, <clears throat> If we understand the three ways that heat does move, then we are better at able to stop it. And we've hinted at all of these as we've been going through here. If we're going to make insulation, we want to stop heat flow. The best insulation is going to stop all three methods of heat flow. And of course, to stop conduction, we want to use something that's not a conductor. So metals are completely out. You will never make 
an insulation out of metal. That would be really, really bad. So we want to use non-metals or non-solids. And the best non-metal, non-solid is air, because pretty much everywhere we go, there's some air around. And so what we want to do is we want to trap the air. And if we can trap the air, we've got it made. It's really cheap. It's very effective. Guess what your clothes do? Trap it. They trap some air in between your body and your clothes. And that air inside is warmer than the air outside is. That nice little air layer of air close to you stays much warmer. That's good. Have you ever seen birds in the no. winter? They fluff up. They fluff up. If you stick your face near the window and you look outside and you go, why are you so fat today, bird? <laughs> that means it's a cold day. The birds fluff on their feathers and they're trapping more air around there. How many people have seen fat birds before? I've seen them. Okay. They're not really fat. They're just fluffing out so they can trap that air. So they're trapping that air in their feathers. That works really, really well. It's a little like when you see this really... Furry, you have know, this really big poofy dog, and then you actually get them wet when they're like tiny. Yes. Things. <laughs> Those True. dogs would not survive well in Laredo because they're too poofy and they <laughs> hold them to me. If we want to stop convection, of course, the only thing that doesn't convect well is a solid. So the best solid is going to be pretty much solid air. That's what styrofoam is. Styrofoam is 99% air and 1% polystyrene. And so you trap air, little tiny air bubbles inside there. That's why it's so super duper light. And so styrofoam, fiberglass, even better a vacuum. If we have a vacuum there, then there's nothing to conduct or convect. And so we like that a lot. And so of course, to stop radiation, we want to use either mirrors or white colors. Have you ever seen when a house is being built and they're slapping insulation on the sides that is all shiny on one side? Yes. Now up north, they put the shiny side in because up north they want to keep the heat in the house because they're worried about long winters. Here in Laredo, we like to put the shiny side out because we're worried about keeping heat out of my house. And, and that becomes, yeah. So um, I'd like to tell you some stories about how to do this well. Ignore this part for right now. Um, I have a house. I live in it. Can you believe it? Okay, so I live in a house, and the house that I live in right now is a house that I designed. The house that I lived in before this was a house that I just bought that somebody else had made and somebody else had designed. And it turns out I know a thing or two about heat movement. And so in Laredo, you spend most of your electricity doing what? What? Air yeah, your air conditioner uses the vast majority of the electricity that you use in your house. So if I want to keep my electricity bills as low as possible, I want to keep my house as cool as possible, and I do this by preventing heat movement. So when I'm designing my house, I look at this and I say, here's my house, here is, here, stop it. Here is my enemy, my enemy is the sun in, in the in the summer. So the sun is constantly beating down on my house and, and where is the sun beating down the most on my house? The roof. Hey, what do you know? This thing is my biggest wall of defense from that guy entering in here. Now, we have this thing called an attic. 90% of the heat that comes into your living space comes in that way. And 90% of the heat that comes into the attic comes this way, from the sun, in through your roof. So you say to yourself, hey, if I could have less of this going to here, then I have less of this going to here, so I'd have to have less of this being pulled out that costs me money. Right? So how do I do this? Well, obviously, you, you want to have a nice thick insulating layer here. That helps to keep the heat from coming from there into here in the first place. But has anybody ever been in their attic before? Yes. Has anybody had to do this in the summer, in the day? Yes. How many people thought they were going to die? Yes. yes, right? You're up in this attic and seriously, within about five seconds, you are covered in sweat. 
and it's just pouring out of your body, and you're breathing plenty, and you say, if I stay up here, I'm going to die. It's about 140, 150 degrees a lot of times in the middle of summer up there. It's ridiculously hot, unless you're in my attic. You can go up into my attic in the middle of July, late afternoon, and it'll be about 110. And you're like, how do you keep your attic so cool? Well, you know, relatively speaking, so cool. Well, again, what's, what's this thing made out of? Wood. And then on top of that, we put a little moisture barrier, and on top of that, we put our shingles. But really, that's made out of wood. That bottom layer is made out of wood. And is wood a good conductor? No. No. Is wood a good convector? No. No. That means the heat that goes through the wood pretty much comes in the form of? Radiation. Radiation. I got special wood. When I was building my house, I told my builder, I said, they make this special wood that has foil attached to it. The foil is already physically attached to the wood. I said, I want that put on my ceiling, and I want to put on the west wall where we get all that hot afternoon sun. And he's like, that's more expensive wood. And I said, I know. It's worth the money. Just do it and charge me the extra. I'll be happy to pay it. And he said, okay, but I think you're wasting the money. Until he got it up. And he got it in. Now, like we said, we like to put insulation up here. Um, imagine you have to put in insulation in a house in July, which was when they were insulating our house in July. So you dress up in nice long sleeve shirts and you put masks on because you don't like to mess with this stuff because if you ever mess with it, you know, it makes you itchy everywhere. And so you have to go up into your typical attic that's 150 degrees and lay this stuff down. This is another important reason why you pay attention to my class instead of having a job like that. Um, right? So <clears throat> these guys have to go up and insulate. They went up into my house and they were like, this is the coolest attic we have ever insulated. This is great. Because what happens is I have this nice reflective barrier right here. So all the heat that's trying to radiate in hits that reflection and hits that nice shiny silver stuff and bounces back up. The wood on my roof is hotter than the wood on your roof. It's not hot enough to burst it into flames, so what do I care? Right? So if I have less heat coming into my attic in the first place, my attic doesn't get so hot. The temperature gradient between the attic and the inside of your house isn't as good, so it's not pushing it through as hard. I don't have to pull out as much. My neighbor did not do this when he built his house. It's fun when we get our mail and we're saying, wow, look at your bill compared to my bill. <laughs> and I get to laugh at him because he has to spend an extra $150 on the bad months every month compared to what I do. It's great. I had a friend, and he bought a house that he did not build. And there was this one spot that was really hot. It was his kitchen. And his kitchen was always hot. And he goes, I can cool down the rest of my house, but my kitchen is always really hot. And I said, well, here's what you want to do. You want to go down to Lowe's. They sell this stuff that's foil that's 24 inches wide, which is the distance between the ceiling joists that hold your ceiling up. They'd go up there, shiny side up, and just staple gun it to the stop. This will make it much better. And so then I'm talking to him about three days later, and he's complaining about how hot his kitchen is. And I said, look, don't complain to me about how hot your kitchen is if I tell you the solution and you're not willing to do it. And he gets all mad at me and hangs up the phone. And then he calls back a couple days later. I went up there and lost like 20 pounds sweating, but today, my attic is cool. My kitchen is cool. My kitchen actually is cool. He got so excited. But then this time of year, it was over Christmas break, he went up and foiled everything in his thing. He's got so much foil up in his attic that you could like light a lighter up there and read by it because it's like <laughs> so shiny up there. It's amazing. But his attic is much, much cooler, his power bills are much lower, and he's actually thankful to me now. 
to say, and when you're designing your house, these are the kind of things you want to think about because if it saves you a hundred bucks a month for the rest of your life, that's kind of a good deal, right? How about now that it's cold? Now that it's cold, it's the same thing. If heat is trying to hit, escape from your house, then it hits that shiny stuff and bounces back in. So that's good too. It works no matter what. Okay, so if we have a thermos, this is the way thermoses were made by the thermos company when I was a little kid. They were amazing. There was a little cork stopper on the top. There's a vacuum between the inner and outer chamber. The inner chamber is mirrored glass and the outer chamber is metal. Now, why do we have a vacuum in between these two? If there's no vacuum, then is there anything to conduct? No, is there anything to convect? No, so if you've got a vacuum in between these two, you've stopped conduction, you've stopped convection. The only thing you need to stop is radiation. radiation. So then you ask yourself, hey, why do we have this mirrored glass here? And you say, hey, that's going to stop radiation. So if I stop conduction and I stop convection and I stop radiation, guess what? You put something cold in there and it stays cold. You put something hot in there and it stays hot. It's wonderful. We used to use these when I was a little kid and we would go sledding. You would make some hot chocolate and then you would just stuff it into the snow and you would sled until you can't feel your face anymore. And then we would go and we would dig it out of the snow and you pour the hot chocolate out and it's still hot. Still burns you. You stick it in your face. <laughs> so... <clears throat> They, they work really, really well. Now, how come the outer container is made out of metal if metal conducts heat so well? Doesn't that seem to be a bad thing? Well, in reality, the outer container and the inner container only touch each other at the very top through a rubber ring. And the rubber does not conduct. And so since there's not really any conduction between the inner and outer container, you can make the outer container out of anything you want. So they make it out of metal because it's stronger. Now, when I was a little kid, we didn't have a cafeteria. We had to bring our lunches in a little thing that was called a lunch box. And, and it had a little crack on it. And you put your sandwich down here and you flip this up and you had it on the top of it, there was a, a thermos. And we would put our milk in there and our milk would stay cold and it would be great. Except about once a week, one of the boys would open up his milk and he would be pouring it out and little chunks of mirror would come out. And it's like, why do you have mirror in your milk? And it turns out that we were playing football on the way to school. We were tossing our thermos around or we were kicking it, playing soccer or doing something stupid like little boys do. And so making this out of mirror glass is not the best thing to hand to a little child. So what happened was by the time I was about your age in high school, these were starting to appear. And so if we look at this sort of thing, we start saying, well, this is showing up in the kids' things. These were still being made for adults, but the bottom one was being made for the kids. What's different about the bottom one? Uh, yeah, we have styrofoam instead of a vacuum. Which one's going to work better? The vacuum's going to work better than styrofoam. The inner chamber is a mirror versus the inner chamber is white. Which one's going to be better? The mirror is going to be better than white. But this is made out of plastic and styrofoam. This one's made out of glass. Which one do you hand to a six-year-old boy? <laughs> the bottom one. So your milk's a tiny bit warmer, but it actually lasts longer than a week. So I have boys. I understand these things. So um, the top one is a much better design. Now a commercial. Much of America's populace thinks it's improper to spank children, so my spouse and I have tried other methods to control our kids when they have one of those moments. One that we found very effective is for me to just take our, car, our child for a car ride and talk. They usually calm down and stop misbehaving after our little car ride together. I've included the photo below of one of my sessions with our son in case he'd like to use the technique. It's very effective. <laughs> 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 okay, seriously, um, <clears throat> there's a test tomorrow. In problems A, you want to circle 1, 4, 5, and 6. In problems B, you want to circle 3, 5, 6, and 9. 
For problem C, you want to circle 1, 2, 5, and 9. And the numbers you need to have stuck inside your head. You need to know that 273 is the difference between? Um, no. Kelvin and centigrade. centigrade. Which one is going to be bigger? Kelvin. Kelvin. So if we're going to Kelvin, we're adding. If we're going away from Kelvin, we are subtracting. But the number you need to know is 273. Zero is what number? Absolute. Well, that would be absolute zero. But the reason that you just need to know zero in general is that is the melting point or freezing point of water, depending on which direction you're going. And 100 is the boiling point of water. So you need to know those numbers because sometimes things like that are built in. Like if a piece of metal is sitting in boiling water and then we take it out of there and stick it into our calorimeter, we know the initial temperature was 100. I didn't have to say 100. I said it was sitting in boiling water. So you're supposed to know, hey, that's 100 degrees. Get it? Yes. Okay. And in a minute, we'll do an ice cube demo. Hooray! Everybody then circling what they need to circle? Yes. Everybody waking up to see that? <laughs> you always got me. <laughs> <laughs>